Good evening, everybody. Before we get started tonight, I'd like to welcome Rich Austin, our Chief of Police, who will lead us in our invocation. Thank you, Mayor. Let us pray. Dear wise and loving Father, we pray your blessings upon this meeting and all those gathered here today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to care for this beautiful community we call Milton. Father, we pray for our elected officials, our city staff, and the community members we serve. We pray that during this time together, you give us all a sense of wisdom, fairness, and justice as we all work together to be good stewards of this great community with which you have blessed us. It is in your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chief. I'd like to call the regular meeting of the Milton City Council for Monday, October 19, 2020, to order. The city strongly recommends that you review tonight's agenda carefully, and if you wish to speak on any item on the agenda, please bring your comment card to the clerk as soon as possible. While the Milton rules allow a speaker to turn in their comment card up until the clerk calls the agenda item, once the agenda item is called, no more comment cards can be accepted. If the city clerk will please call roll and make general announcements. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll be happy to call roll for the October 19th, 2020 regular meeting. I would like to remind those in attendance to please silence all cell phones at this time. Those attending the meeting who would like to make a public comment, you are required to complete a public comments card prior to speaking on the item. Your comment card must be presented to the city clerk prior to the agenda item being called. All speakers, please identify yourself by name, address, and organization before beginning your comment. If you are representing an organization, an affidavit is required stating you have the authority to speak on behalf of that organization. Please review tonight's agenda, and if you would like to make a public comment, please bring your comment card to me now. Demonstration of any sort within the chamber is prohibited. Please refrain from any applause, cheering, booing, outburst or dialogue with any person speaking. Anyone in violation will be asked to leave. As I call roll this evening, please confirm your attendance. Mayor Joe Lockwood. Here. Councilmember Rick Morig. Here. Councilmember Peyton Jamison. Here. Councilmember Carol Kirkley. Here. Councilmember Joe Longoria. Here. And Councilmember Paul Moore. Here. For the record, Councilmember Laura Bentley is absent. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to welcome everyone and thank you for being here tonight. Now I'll ask the city clerk to sound the next item, which is approval of the meeting agenda. The next item is approval of the meeting agenda, agenda item number 2287. Okay. Does anybody have any changes or comments on the agenda? If not, I'll ask for a motion. Mr. Mayor, I make motion that we approve the meeting agenda as prepared. Second. Okay. I have a motion for approval for Councilmember Moore with a second from Councilmember Moore. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Next item is public comment. Do we have any general public comment? I have not been given a card. Stacy, do you have any? No, okay. sir. All right. Well, we will move on then to the consent agenda. If uh, the clerk would please read the consent agenda items. Our first item is approval of the September 9th, 2020 regular city council meeting minutes. Agenda item number 2288. Our next item is an approval of an task order between City of Milton and <coughs> BM and KPC to provide construction inspection for the Hope Roll Road at Thompson Road and Hope Roll Road at Hamby Road intersection projects. Agenda item number 20289. Our third item is approval of a task order between the City of Milton and BM and KPC to provide pre-construction and pre-acquisition services for Morris Road widening and Big Creek Greenway Trail connection projects. Agenda item number 2290. Our next item is an approval of a task order between the City of Milton and BM and KPC to provide construction inspection for the Saddle Springs Drive culvert repair project. Agenda item number 2291. 
Our fifth item is an approval of a consent to assumption agreement between the City of Milton and Granicus LLC for the renewal of the subscription agreement. Agenda item number 2292. Our next item is approval of a construction services agreement between the City of Milton and Prime Contractors, Inc. for interior remodeling of Fire Station 43's training room and support services offices. Agenda item number 2293. Our seventh item is approval of a change order number two to the agreement between the City of Milton and App Zorro Technologies, Inc. to finish the ongoing design and development of the smartphone application for the City's Smart Communities Grant Project, Walking School Bus. Agenda item number 2294. Our next item is approval to amend the agreement between the City of Milton and Voya Retirement Insurance and Annuity Co Company to allow a single general purpose loan for the employee's 401A account. Agenda item number 2295. Our ninth and final item on the consent agenda is approval of subdivision plats and revision. The name of the development is Caleb Negron Property, 2095 and 2098 Birmingham Road. It's landlot 406, District 2, Section 2. It's a minor plat combining two parcels into one single family residential lot with a total acres of 8.81 acres and the density is 0 0.113 lots per acre. Okay. Agenda item number 2296. Thank you. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Mayor, I move that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. second. Okay, I've got a motion from Council Member Longoria with a second from uh, Council Member Cookerly. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's unanimous. So we'll move on to reports and presentations. So, Amy, if you'll please. Sound the first item. That item is presentation of Police Fleet Management Program, Police Chief Rich Austin. Greetings, Mayor, members of Council. For a few months now, uh, staff has been looking into a fleet management model that a few of our neighboring jurisdictions are utilizing uh, that we think may bring some significant cost savings to our city. Uh, tonight we have with us from Enterprise Fleet Management, Mike Larson, uh, Rachel McGurr, and Mark Torrey. Uh, we've been working with their team to conduct some rather extensive analysis of our fleet, uh, looking for opportunities to reduce our expenditures and maximize our city's motor vehicle assets while continuing to maintain a very highly dependable fleet. Uh, tonight the team is going to present the Enterprise model for fleet management and just discuss a bit about how their program might be beneficial to the city of Milton. The goal of tonight's presentation is simply to provide council with some detailed information as staff may be bringing this idea back to you all in the near future for further consideration. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to the Enterprise Fleet Management Team, uh, Rachel McGurr, uh, Mark Torrey, and Mike Larson. Thank you. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening. How are y'all this evening? Good. Evening. Yeah. Well, I hope that you and your families are all doing well during all, during this uncertain times. Um, so, and thank you, Chief, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Larkins. I'm with Enterprise Fleet Management. Uh, yes, that name does ring a bell, just like the normal enterprise you see on almost every corner uh, as a rental car company. Uh, funny enough, Enterprise Rental Car Company actually started as a fleet management company a long time ago, about 63 years to be exact. Our goal, uh, specifically our goal this evening, uh, is working with cities and counties across the state of Georgia and the United States to help identify the total cost of ownership and the lowest cost of ownership for the fleet within each city. Uh, what we do is we understand and truly evaluate uh, the numbers, really the maintenance numbers, the fuel numbers, how much the annual spend is for vehicles, what's the average age of the vehicle within that fleet, uh, what you're, how you're buying the vehicle, and then most importantly, how you're selling the vehicle on the backside. Uh, really, the, within that situation, what we've identified wholly is vehicles being um, held longer, getting less money on the backside for the vehicle at resale, and really in between having higher operating costs like fuel and maintenance. 
With your fleet specifically, we've identified a few areas of opportunity uh, to create a partnership with Enterprise Fleet Management, lower the total cost of owning and operating the vehicles in your fleet, reduce the total downtime, reduce the operating expenses such as excess maintenance, excess fuel cost uh, due to fuel degradation. And the biggest piece that a lot of people miss out on is really maximize the resale on the backside for that vehicle, lowering the total cost of owning and operating vehicles in your fleet. I think we have a presentation that's got a model on it. Yep. Here we go. So is this... All right, so what we've really identified uh, within the vehicles in your fleet is, and we, we took a really deep dive in both the entire fleet for the city of Milton and the fleet for just the police department specifically. Uh, this presentation specifically relates to the police department vehicles. Um, of tw 22 vehicles of a light and medium duty fleet are seven years of age or older. Uh, that 5.7 5 years is the current average age of the fleet meaning it would take about nine and a half years to completely, completely refresh or go through the entire fleet of vehicles in the police department. Um, if, we, if we are to reduce the average age of the vehicles within that fleet by just um, a five-year hold for those vehicles, it could produce savings by maximizing on the operating costs and the resale on the backside. It could produce savings to the city of Milton in excess of $368,000. Really, the results are our goals is to not create a partnership that lasts one year, but it's to create a partnership where we identify cost savings opportunities, run a safer, newer fleet for the city, and it's a partnership that is, is long-lasting so we can truly work together to, to keep the people of the city or that work for the city in safer vehicles while benefiting the city financially. Mark, I'll let you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Torrey. I'm an account manager at Enterprise Fleet Management. Um, I work with about 14 different state government entities across the state of Georgia. Um, I work with uh, Cherokee County, uh, City of Covington, just to name a few, City of Hiram as well. Um, also, I work with for uh, Georgia Forestry Commission with all their fleet of vehicles. Um, my job is really to evaluate their fleet of vehicles yearly. Um, really putting what we, the plan that we put in place um, for the city and really sticking to that plan. Because um, a lot of times, especially with the COVID and how things are right now with budgets, um, the first thing you think about is, hey, how can we save money? Well, that's really what my job is um, for those cities and counties, to really help them save money. The fleet analysis that we put together for you is a really a five-year model in this, um, in this example. We usually do a 10-year model, but this is a five-year example um, just because that's more of a fine-tuned, um, dialed-down version. So if you look on the left side, the current fleet of vehicles is 65 vehicles in fleet. Um, the proposed fleet, we feel like we may have some additional growth in the next five years, so the proposed fleet is 67 vehicles. Um, the current cycle right now, um, nine years to cycle out of all your vehicles. Um, the proposed cycle with Enterprise Fleet Management, that would be five years, um, going from a nine-year to a five-year cycle. Um, cents per mile, as far as the maintenance, when we got your maintenance number, it looked like it was about $120 per month per vehicle. Uh, with our fixed and budgeted maintenance program, we feel we could, uh, we have the proposed maintenance at $70 per vehicle. And then uh, as far as the price per gallon, um, average national price per gallon, 215 as far as the gas is concerned. But I want to keep this really at a high level perspective for you guys, and Mike, you can um, <laughs> jump in if you want. Uh, but really, the, the yellow line at the top here is what you guys are currently doing today. So right now, we're, we have about seven vehicles that we need yearly currently in the fleet. Um, we own about six and a half vehicles. Uh, but what we're trying to do is really get you guys on a rotation. So right now, we feel based off the six or the seven needs that you guys have, you're spending $275,000 in cash per year on those police vehicles. What we're proposing is going away from the cash model and helping you guys do more with less with the enterprise fleet management model. Um, the biggest things in police vehicles, and my experience so far, has been the equipment that goes in those vehicles is very expensive. So how do we retain that and also retain the equity in those vehicles? Well, we need to get out of them a lot quicker than what we're doing currently because the models change a lot. Uh, the models change, by the time, by time you guys change a fleet vehicle out, it may, the models probably already change. So therefore we need to probably take advantage of that a little bit quicker than what we're doing now. 
So really what we're doing is moving buckets around. So on the, on the gold line, your maintenance is $93,600 based off of last year's budget from what we got. And then also the fuel budget was $259,935 for a total fleet budget of $628,000 of fleet budget. So what, if you go down to the 2021 line, what our plan would be for you guys is instead of annual needs at seven or seven per year, what we'd be doing is also doing six per year, or annual needs at six in 2021, 14 in 2022. But what that does is we're moving buckets around. Instead of purchasing vehicles at $275,000, we are now getting into six leased vehicles at $59,768. So that's part one of showing how we can show savings as far as the police vehicles are concerned. Also, we have vehicles, older vehicles in the fleet that a lot of times when we come in contact with cities and counties, the biggest thing you guys miss out on is we the resale aspect of a vehicle. What Enterprise has proved through the model that we have built through our rental car side is that we can buy for low and sell for high. That is how Enterprise um, has been so successful over 63 years. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take that model and hand it over to the government sector because you guys do such a good job of buying vehicles. Well, if, we, if you guys do such a good job, just like Enterprise rent car does of buying vehicles, why not take advantage of the resale market? The resale market is, the, especially right now with COVID-19, manufacturers are shut down for about three and a half months. So right now we're seeing, an we're seeing less and less vehicles at a dealership's lot. Therefore, we are approaching cities and counties. Myself, uh, myself uh, for example, city of Covington, I just approached them. They've been a customer of ours for about almost two years. So they had pickup trucks in their fleet. What, what we're doing is after 14 months, they're able to get out of nine pickup trucks and we're able to get them $66,000 in equity in those nine pickup trucks and roll that into brand new vehicles, which not only either lowers your cash outlay per month or we can put that back in the general fund. Those are the two ways we can do that. But our job is really just to help evaluate the fleet, help you guys retain the equity in the vehicles that you have because at the end of the day, it's a depreciating asset. You want to make sure you're taking advantage of the equity that you guys have and really roll that in there. But also, what does that cause? Because we're adding six brand new vehicles in, we're getting out of six old vehicles now. With six old vehicles going out of the fleet, not only are we gonna help our operational costs with fuel and maintenance costs, um, we're also gonna lower our total fleet budget. So we're predicting in the first year of lowering that or a net cash positive of $266,271. And that's because we're getting out of older vehicles that are probably the, ho the highest cost and maintenance cost and also the highest cost in fuel costs because of fuel degradation, because we have vehicles that are eight years or older, eight years or older out there in the fleet. Um, also on top of that, we wanna make sure that these guys are driving in safe vehicles. Um, at the end of the day, the police officer is extremely important and we wanna make sure that they're driving around in safe vehicles and if we have eight to 10 year old vehicles out there, can you really say that might be the safest vehicle that that person can be in? So with us, with us giving you guys a proactive replacement plan allows not only for you guys to have less costs, but also allows you guys to have a safer vehicle out there on the road and also be able to save the, the city money, which is really the most important part. Okay, anything to add? Yeah, I think that, so you see a five-year model ahead in front of you. Oftentimes we'll show a five-year model, a 10-year model, but. <laughs> The important piece is, isn't necessarily day one of the partnership. It's after year one, after year two, year five, year 10, because that's the true testament of the value of the partnership, right? And so at the end of the day, what we really hope to accomplish and to achieve by showing the model is not only the plan is effective and, puts, and lowers the average age of the vehicles of your fleet, but it's sustainable. It's a plan that is sustainable over time. Um, we're a company that doesn't doesn't create partnerships that last for six months or one year. We want long-lasting partnerships. So that's why we show this model over five years. But I'm confident by lowering the average age of the vehicles in the fleet, by constantly uh, leveraging enterprise fleet management as a partner, um, like Mark said, you'll have all of the, the, we'll call it the civilians as well as the employees of the city in safer vehicles um, while keeping them uh, at a lowest cost of ownership. Any questions? I have a question. Um, yes, sir. So some of our neighboring cities or counties, are you guys working with, uh, I think I understand, Roswell? Yes, sir. So um, how's that 
how long is that contract or so partnership? Been? So Roswell, that partnership began, I like to think that the partnership begins when we first start talking because I feel like all the work really goes into the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the partnership, I feel like uh, it, we were fully executed about a year and a half now, maybe maybe two years ago now. We're, um, we're on second, we're, we're in the talks of the third round of orders for them. And, and what's interesting is every single city we ever communicate with has different goals and objectives. And uh, the, the great thing about a partnership with us is we can help achieve really any of it. And so I, to give you an example, uh, Roswell had, an, had a goal of a, uh, replenishing their equipment replacement fund from day one. And so we utilized the previous fiscal year vehicle orders to help them cash out on the current equity in those. So we cashed that out. Um, they were able to completely replenish the, their vehicle replacement fund. They lowered the average age of the vehicles in their fleet from about six years, maybe six years and change, to about four and a half. Their, their main objective was to be on a preventative maintenance only program because they found that most of their vehicles upwards of 95,000 miles and greater spent more time in the shop. I think all of us understand that vehicles with higher mileage are more at risk. So the Roswell partnership is going great. Um, we work we work really well with all those departments that are there. And I, I imagine that, that the fleet will be 100% uh, penetrated in the next two years, we'll just say. I have a okay. couple questions. If anyone. So how big is this aspect of enterprise? Yep. So we actually, it's funny you ask that because today um, I got an email that we just uh, delivered our 400,000th vehicle. So to answer that question, we have 400,000 vehicles on the road with government entities alone. In what time frame? Over the last, well, we started working with government a long time ago uh, because we started, we partnered with the state of Georgia in 2011. I say that's a long time ago, almost 10 years ago. So, and we, work, we were working with government prior to that. So it's a safe assumption without giving finite details mm -hmm. for 10 years. You mentioned fixed maintenance cost, and it, it could have been my inability to follow on that, but are those fixed maintenance costs on your side or on our side? Are we held to a fixed maintenance schedule? So, so we recommend following manufacturer, manufacturer recommendations for maintenance. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, everything that you want to do, you can do. What that really means is our only job is to make recommendations and provide value based on our 2.2 million vehicles on the road. Uh, but to go back into the maintenance piece, there are several different maintenance options, whether it's a fixed maintenance program, which covers everything from the windshield wiper blades to the engine falling out of the vehicle, to a pass-through maintenance program, to no maintenance program at all. You can do anything that the city feels comfortable doing. Um, I will add the caveat that the emergency response vehicles are only eligible for the pass-through only because they're a high-risk vehicle. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we see them as a high-risk vehicle for putting a maintenance program on it, but they still have the ability to go to any maintenance shop anywhere, have that vehicle maintained and overseen by ASE certified tech, but most importantly, leverage enterprise size and purchasing power for the rates. Okay, but you're not trying to create that as a profit center for enterprise? No. That, everything that we do and everything that we have is a la carte. Okay. And my last question yes, is... If it's not working and a municipality wants out of the program, what's the out clause? Oh, it's it's actually great. I think you'll I think you'll love it. Um, in 1957, when our owner created the company, he said that we have to earn our business every single day. So what I mean by that is there is no commitment, there is no contract. There's a funding mechanism, right, mm -hmm. for funding, um, but there is no contract to be partners with Enterprise. Um, if you say in Week one, it's not working out, and, and you want to fire us, by all means, fire us. We've never had that happen. Let me knock on wood. <laughs> um, but, but it's our job. Everything about what we do is, and this might be surprising, but probably a pleasant surprise, everything that we do is based on customer service. And what I mean by that is if we're not providing exceptional service, we expect you to fire us. And so we're graded on customer service the way that we – um, actually progress in our careers is even graded on service. So I can't stand here in front of you and tell you things that are not true because I wouldn't be following the values and the guidelines of our company. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the presentation. Okay. Paid.
Um, on the uh, maintenance, I know you said a proposed seventy dollars maintenance. So what doesn't that uh, in include? What so that not include? so when when we take the maintenance from a one hundred and twenty dollar average to a seventy dollar average, I know I know in the model it. it a model is a number, right? So it, it seems like it's a hard number. It's essentially an algorithm that we use by taking the older vehicles out of the fleet and um, replacing them with the newer vehicles. But but it's funny enough, seventy dollars is an average monthly maintenance cost for our fixed budgeted program, and that really includes everything. Uh, the only thing it does not include is our two wear items because it's they're very predictable, and those are tires and brakes. And you would assume that 120 a month on our end includes tires and brakes. So, the, so the 120 a month on your end came from an actual number. Did it have tires or brakes in it? Um, I think it did. I think it did. Okay, so so okay, it, it would have. That's kind of what I was assuming. Um, and I guess the only other thing is I would like to see a 10 year plan. That's okay. just me because sure. I see those numbers start going down, down, and down. And I'm assuming in year 25, I guess was it year 25? That's 601,000. That's that's lease payments. To you, correct? That's that's a lease. That's an annual lease payment, correct? Correct. Sixty-seven vehicles. That's okay. correct. Okay. okay. So one of the big one of the big areas we focus on, because I, I see the direction that that your your question is going. One of the big areas we focus on. Well, yes, the lease bucket or the we'll just call it the capital bucket right. is is going up. The fleet budget overall. Our goal is because while the acquisition side does have a, a rise because we're replacing vehicles sooner. Right. Right. Um, I think I would think that we all would agree that. Newer vehicles cost less to maintain. So while the acquisition bucket rises in cost, the maintenance bucket, I'm just using bucket Correct. as an analogy, yep. the maintenance bucket will reduce because we have less of those unpredictable repairs, which any of the predictable or any of the unpredictable repairs tend to cost a lot, right? And then naturally um, our fuel economy is better. I mean, even pickup trucks, it's, it's wild to think that pickup trucks nowadays get 22 miles per gallon, when five years ago they got 12. <laughs> you know, so just fuel economy in general. So we, we anticipate and we've seen just through our relationships currently, all of those cost to lower. So all of the operating costs throughout the year that you have, you can anticipate those driving downwards. But then the big pieces on the backside, really capturing the equity in the vehicles that, that flatten out that fleet budget or at least get you a savings to where you are today. Thank you. But we can put together the 10 year model for you. Absolutely. Thanks. Joe. So we've got no contract that we have to sign with you. You guys are willing to accept us telling you to get out of our lives day two if that happens. Day right? two. So <laughs> the touch points of this engagement on, let's just say a typical customer of yours, mm -hmm. day one. Do you come in and wait or assess the vehicles? It sounds like you've done a certain amount of that already. Is there an acquisition that occurs immediately, or is this a rolling kind of a thing that as the cars or fleet vehicles come up for replacement, that's when you get involved and you engage at that point? Because I'm having... Right. So I want to answer a couple things. The first one, there is a contract, <laughs> yeah. but it is, it is a contract answer. that you can get out of at any moment. It's a master lease agreement. Yeah. Essentially says you're going to insure the vehicles, right. pay the pay, pay right. the, things like okay. that. Right. Um, so I wanted to make sure I was clear on that. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to the relationship itself, I'm really glad you asked that question because the reason I have Mark here today, the reason Rachel's here today, uh, and there are others who cannot be here today, they are actually your account team. And we don't, we don't come to you and say, hey, congratulations, thank you for the partnership, get these vehicles, we'll see you in a year, or we'll see you in five years. That's not what we want to do. We, we essentially have an implementation of the program. And while we make recommendations of what the average age or the average cycle should look like, um, you can still set the plan that makes the most sense for you. We're, all we do is follow the numbers and present the numbers. And so really the way that works, let's just, let's just say that we went with the plan that's on the screen today that shows six vehicles in year one. If we went with that plan, we w we've already specced all those out, so we have all that information through the conversations we've been having, we would get those vehicles on order. 
right? We want to make sure we get in line. Emergency response vehicles are hot commodities, right? <laughs> and so we would get those vehicles on order. In the meantime, we would be doing account team introductions to the right personnel to make sure they know who Mark is, they know who Rachel is, they know who the, our account fleet coordinator is. But then also we would be going over all of the other tools that are available to you and at your disposal. The website, the houses that could house your entire fleet and its data. The, you'll have an invoice review. There are mobile apps that are, that are available for all of your drivers. So what you're saying is it's a blended program for a certain period of time as we get out of the vehicles that we're in today and replace them with vehicles that you guys Correct. Are provide. Correct. I, I would never ask you to come replace a vehicle that's a year old, right? It's, it's definitely a blended program. Um, for instance, uh, Mark and I were talking earlier, the Cherokee County, they've been a customer for about four years. They're about, we have about 75% of their fleet has made it onto the program. The remaining 25% has yet to be cycled. And so we don't, we don't bring everything on because it doesn't make financial sense. Okay. Yeah, the only reason I was asking is because other companies that offer similar things, but let's say for computers, for example, right. hardware, they come in and day one engage on everything. They assess how old is it, whether it needs to be replaced immediately. If it doesn't, they will provide you a certain amount of money for that thing. So in essence, they basically buy all your assets right. and you end up leasing back day right. one. But that's not what you guys are proposing. No. That's not what we're proposing, but I'm not saying that people haven't asked for that in the past. Um, like, like I said earlier, there's anything, you can do anything. Um, but what, what I've typically seen in a situation like that is there is a lot of disruption. Meaning, like, we'll just use the computer example. When there's a when all the computers are getting turned in and, and switched over to new, there's a lot of disruption in daily activities by by personnel use, using those assets, correct? And so what I've seen typically whenever we cycle out of an entire fleet up front, there's a lot of disruption, right? And so financially, it might not make cost sense. Um, but like I said, there's you can do anything. There's nothing you cannot do. My job, Mark's job, Rachel's job is to propose the lowest cost of ownership and what makes the most sense based on your trends. Okay. And my, really my job is to really be a, call, a consultant for the city to bring recommendations to you guys, show you what's the lowest cost of ownership, and then make a decision on a per vehicle analysis, whether it makes sense to either replace that vehicle or hold on to that vehicle. I'm not afraid to go into a meeting and say, hey, based off what we're seeing in fuel maintenance costs and what we're seeing in the resale market, hold on to that vehicle for 12 more months because you're going to make more equity because of it. At the end of the day, it's all about you guys and what you want to do. Our job is just to put forward the best business recommendation for you guys and really put that into place. Okay, Rick. Yeah, so, so looking, at, looking at your example, so by year five, it looks like we'd be totally out of purchase as far as owning vehicles. It would be total lease, and then I saw the, the numbers start to change. That's where I think it would be good to actually see the 10-year say, okay, when we're totally with you from a lease standpoint, what right. does that do from a cost standpoint? Absolutely. Kind of extrapolate it out. Absolutely. I mean, we can anticipate in six having greater equity. And because of the newer vehicles, but then it would, it would obviously be it would be it would flatten out. Okay. Because by that time everything's in, so there's no reason other than more fuel efficient vehicles hitting the road, things like that. But it would flatten out. But I'm we're happy to put together a ten year for you. Okay. And looking at your example, that's actually doing analysis of our current fleet with police. That's looking at the age of the vehicles, and then again instead of going at seven and a half years, you're using a five year replacement. So Correct. that's why we see different numbers each year. Correct. And then I would assume it starts to then stay steady once we get into years six through ten. Correct. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yes. Paul? I want to build on uh, one of Joe's uh, questions where you guys gave a pretty good example on, on the, the computer turnover as the example. And Joe's question about the acquisition of the entire fleet. Well, I experienced this at one point in my career with a consumer products company. We went from uh, individual vehicles to fleet vehicles. <clears throat> And they came in and actually acquired the entire fleet because there's the back room part of that that comes off of your books, our books, then, too. You're and absolutely if right. you're not having to do, if you only take, let's say, half of our vehicles, that means I've still got headcount managing tires, you know, oil changes, et cetera. Right. So there's potentially an advantage to look at that. I don't, I'm not encouraging that we reduce our headcount. We, we value each employee that's part of our Milton team today, but there is potentially a reduced. Um, 
responsibility for them when you've taken half of the vehicles off our books. So I'm assuming there's a scenario where we can measure that, or you can show us the Absolutely. pros and cons of those two. Absolutely. I'm happy to. The only, the only challenging piece will be some of your emergency response vehicles. And the reason I say that is manufacturers, I'm, I'm convinced they work with the aftermarket vendors to change models and change dimensions. Yeah, sure. Right? And so um, if, if you came to us and said, we want you to acquire the entire fleet, write us a check for the equity, um, let's do that to change things on the books, right? Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it is you're looking to accomplish, right. we absolutely would want to do an evaluation to show you how that would look if it landed that way. Right. Um, but well, in the scenario that I'm contemplating too, you you don't necessarily take all of our vehicles out of our the existing fleet. It may be that the, the ten additional that are not scheduled for rotation right now, that may be in the next five years of rotation, you actually acquire those. They stay as an existing vehicle in our fleet. We're just we're just leasing it from you rather than gotcha. us owning it right. at this point. Yeah. So there's that model to contemplate right. mm -hmm. too. Has that come into play for you? It has. Um, so my example with Roswell, um, I think it was in their fiscal year 17 or 18, I recall off the top of my head, they had acquired about, it was about $1.2 million in, in assets. And um, we valued them. We essentially just took the invoice mm -hmm. and the PO mm -hmm. and then cut them the check back mm -hmm. uh, because they, they were looking very similar. They wanted to get caught up sooner than later because they wanted the managed program to be in under one roof, if you will. Yeah. And so they accomplished several goals there. We headed to that direction faster, but then their, like I said, their equipment replacement fund got to the dollar amount that they were trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see it. I mean, in the scenario that I've experienced, that's the only thing I have to go on, obviously. There was, we had contemplated some of those scenarios, too, where we kept part of it versus turning it all over. And it was actually Enterprise right. that took it over from us. And... Ultimately, we decided that there was a lot less confusion about, is this a fleet car? Is this right. a city car? Where is it in the maintenance schedule? Who's in charge of it? Is it still in-house people that are managing that versus managing it with the one number you call for right. enterprise, et cetera? So I look forward to maybe some more deep dive on we those kinds of scenarios and how that plays out for us. Yes, sir. There was another part of your presentation I didn't quite follow, okay. and that had to do with the equipment that was in the vehicles. So when you do a switch over a vehicle coming out of our fleet going into your fleet and we're leasing it back from you, does the equipment stay? Does the equipment that's in a retired vehicle move into the new vehicle? So there, there are two options. So option A is we sell the vehicle as is, equipped. Option B is if that equipment is still up to the latest, we'll just call it regulations mm -hmm. for you know, lack of better terms, um, then potentially it could be moved from A to B. Let's say you had a, I'm not up to speed on the latest um, equipment, heavy duty equipment, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say a piece of equipment was 1500 to $2,000 and it worked as good as day one on, we'll just call it year five. Mm -hmm. Potentially that could be moved from A to B. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, our, our job is to continue to show you, okay, if we sold the vehicle equipped as is, how does it look? And what does it look like if you move from A to B? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, it makes the most sense to sell that asset as is. Maybe there's a few items that you recover. Obviously, the things that stay with the vehicle are like radios, computers, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other equipment, the, the value diminishes dramatically. Yep. But you can gain more value by selling it the way it is. Mm -hmm. To We'll just call it a, an area or a, a municipality or county or whoever buys it, right? who doesn't necessarily have the capital to go get a brand new unit. Mm -hmm. It actually took me down the path of my next um, question. That is, part of my understanding of your model depends, our, the benefit to us is turning vehicles at the right time. Correct. So then the greatest equity comes out of the vehicle that's going out of our fleet and we're getting the right cost of the vehicle coming into our fleet. Correct. So it's the value, it's the, it's the asset management of the outgoing that I'm interested in. So you want to sell at the optimal number that creates the most equity for us. What drives that? Who's the target audience for that? So, 
So we have a, a, an entire department that has about a thousand individuals that that's their only job. Mm -hmm. And I am able to scratch the surface in that question today. Um, I've got professionals that work directly for me that can really get into the weeds and go down the rabbit hole. Um, so, so specifically, Enterprise sells about 1.2 million vehicles a year. Mm -hmm. Since we have 400,000 units on lease today just to government, um, it's actually surprising, uh, Mark brought up an example, a lot of entities do a very short flip or a short hold because you have the benefit of not paying tax at each registration, mm -hmm. right? And so really, realistically, the equity is always yours without the cost of, the, of replacing like we have as individuals. Um, and so really what drives it, number one, market conditions drive everything. Uh, number two is really time of the year. And so oftentimes, because um, we have two really big times of the year that we look at ordering and we look at cycling, if you will. Um, and they coincide, incidentally, with when the manufacturers open up their banks, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it works. It, it gets to basic supply and demand principles. Mm -hmm. And when... Um, when different entities need to cycle. And then typically it's within budget cycles that coincidentally in Georgia usually run hand in hand with each other. Okay. Um, well, I look forward to learning more about that. Absolutely. Obviously we want to make sure that when we get on the right cycle, right. then we're maximizing the equity and the equipment that we're flipping. Yep, absolutely. Um, the last question I've got is really sort of, you, you mentioned the impact of COVID. Is COVID creating, what kind of an anomaly is COVID creating for it? Is it creating a, a more um, target-rich environment for this to be to our advantage? Or is it one of these where we're coming in and this is the worst case scenario? Like you talked about right. fleet availability. We know if manufacturers' inventory is low, probably the cost, they're not going to be as willing to negotiate on the cost of the vehicles. Are we, are we buying at the wrong time if right. there's a COVID anomaly? Can you right. help me understand so that a little bit? Here's the great thing. When you order a vehicle, just like you probably have done in the past for the most part, when you order a vehicle, that pricing is set. Uh, the incentives are set, and it's, it's best case pricing. Mm -hmm. So the demand itself isn't by ordering direct from the manufacturer like you're used to. Great news. Bad news is if you have a vehicle go down and it's at a dealership, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's happened is because the, the manufacturers were shut down for three months, that's a lot of vehicles that didn't hit the road for three mm -hmm. months. So when you start looking at the supply and demand, the dealers need to make their profit to keep their lights on. So they are selling vehicles for higher than they normally would. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the challenge. So that's why we have to plan and proactively replace so we're, we don't get impacted negatively by a situation like what happened this year. Mm -hmm. um, here's the great news about manufacturers shutting down. There's always a catch-22. The great news is because there's low supply on the resale, any of the units that you need to sell, I would sell them now. <laughs> because you're going to get top dollar for real because people need vehicles. Um, I mean, we, we lately, we, we've gone into South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida to get vehicles because we want to make sure we always get the best buy, you know? And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a catch 22, but that's why you have us to give you the information to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you. And it sounds like we have a lot to learn, and we look forward to you guys helping us understand that. Awesome. No, thank you. And, and just to kind of recap and, and tell me if I'm off, off track, obviously, uh, you know, you bring a third party or partnership in. There's no free lunch out there. You guys have to make money. Um, but what it sounds like to me, you, with your buying power, um, hopefully get a better, better cost on the front end purchasing. Um, as far as maintaining and operating the vehicles, they're basically the city operates and uses them just like we own them. Exactly. We take care of the maintenance and whatnot, general maintenance, just like we have been. Um, but also then I think what I'm hearing, the advantage is on the uh, disposition side that, you know, hopefully you guys can get more uh, more for them than if we stripped them down and sent them to auction or whatever and get, you know, a couple hundred bucks for them. So sounds like, obviously, your company's got to make some money, but then we also benefit for the efficiencies and, and the guidance and the, um, you know, experience that you guys bring us, correct? And so it sounds like from my council, they're interested to learn more, and if you guys could run some, you know, maybe a 10-year plan and, and, you know, meet with our staff and all that and, and yeah. submit it, to, and we, uh, we really appreciate your help and, uh, and your time here tonight. Absolutely. Thank you all, all for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. It's yours. Rachel? Close this out. All right. Okay, if our city clerk would please call the next.
sound the next fi <laughs> final presentation item. That final item is discussion of text amendments relating to a proposed new use permit for farm winery consumption on premises of beer and or liquor. City Architect Robert Bashimi and Robin McDonald. Good to see everybody tonight. Um, so here I am back again. I'm also um, Sarah Ladarts here as well to um, answer any questions that may come up associated with um, this topic, um, specializing in the alcohol, actual alcohol ordinances. Um, so let me get started here. Um, Tonight, we're going to be um, reviewing the text amendments relating to a proposed new use permit for w farm winery consumption on premises of beer and or liquor. So you're like, I feel like this is, we've done this before. <laughs> and you did. Um, we talked about this um, in August, but let me just go back through some different facts. Um, a farm winery in of itself is a permitted use by right within the AG1 Agricultural Zoning District, i.e. they can raise grapes, um, they can produce wine, they can serve wine, and there's certain particulars that the state requires them to do. So it's not just a free-for-all, but as far as zoning, it is uh, permitted um, as a right if they want to do it. Um, Council, you all approved some amendments to Chapter 4, the alcoholic beverages to allow the selling of the wine at the farm winery that's uh, allowed uh, by right. And within uh, those discussions, um, the council directed um, the community development staff with assistance from uh, uh, Sarah to propose a new use permit to allow the sale of, sale of beer and or liquor on a farm winery. So this is outside of you know, the usual uh, wine that's grown on the uh, property, as well as I believe that they're allowed to import other Georgia wines, et cetera, to be served on the property. Um, staff, uh, we presented a draft use permit to you all on August 10th, uh, work session. Um, it was then directed for us to continue on with um, this process, and we sent a draft uh, text amendment to the uh, to start with the community zoning information meeting on August 25th, which there were no community members attended, either in person or via Zoom. Then um, we uh, presented uh, it at a planning commission meeting, utilizing the input from you all um, in the August work session. Tonight, we're uh, asking for further direction from council before proceeding, so the next steps for this text amendment right now is a first presentation of the proposed amendments on November 2nd and then a final vote um, on November 16th. So let me just go over what happened at the Planning Commission meeting on September 23rd. Um, the Planning Commission recommended denial of the proposed use permit in a vote of 4 to 2. Um, the majority of members did not support the proposal. They stated that by approving the use permit, it would be permitting a bar in the agricultural district, and it is a slippery slope. So here is, um, to the right, um, is what went before um, uh, the Planning Commission members. Uh, so we, from previously, we reduced uh, the acreage uh, from 20 to 5, and that it would just be the use permit wouldn't require that all five acres be um, the vineyard. It could just be minimum five acres of the property. Um, a maximum of 25% gross revenue of the wine winery may be from the sale of beer and liquor. Uh, food must be available. This is not to be considered a requirement. For a full kitchen, talked about how pertinent state and city licenses shall be obtained. Uh, permits and or approvals shall be obtained for the building, life safety, land development. So you can't just have this farm winery and, you know, some a lean-to and whatever. There has to be um, some processes for them uh, to go through uh, for those different items. 
so there was some discussion in August how to deal with uh, development standards, so we talked about how some of our other use permits look at a case-by-case -case basis depending upon the size and the situation of a property. So that's what we had also um, proposed. As well as um, seven, we talked about um, a lot of items would not be allowed to be within 100 feet of the property lines, and then I'm going to uh, look at this again in our most updated proposal because it, it will have changed a bit after some further research. Um, again, maximum number of attendees and hours of operation will be um, case by case. That's how we uh, do the event facility, the agricultural event facility. Parking uh, should be 100 feet from all property lines, screen from roads, uh, you know, what it's going to be made of, and then one parking space per 2.5 attendees, which is the same requirement we have for the rural event facility. Um, so that's what we presented to the Planning Commission. Um, so since that point in time, uh, staff has made some revisions to that proposal, um, utilizing some uh, Planning Commission comments, some further, further internal discussions, and the Council's input from the August work session. I went back to listen to y'all's comments and input because I felt like that um, there had been some time passed and I needed to make sure that um, uh, we addressed those issues. Uh, and then, so right now, staff is looking for any further comments, suggestions, prior to continuing on to the process of the first presentation on November 2nd. So here is um, uh, the proposed use permit. You see in red um, some changes from the original one. So let me just highlight uh, uh, some additions and subtractions. So one of them was a number two, the owner of the subject property may reside on the site. You know, that was just making it clear that you could have somebody who lived on the property or possibly didn't. If it's your preference that they live on the property, we can change that. It's just, um, we're, I was just trying to be as flexible as possible. Um, we kept it at 25% of total gross revenue of the fine winery, maybe from the sale of beer and liquor. From what I heard you say in August, um, I think you all wanted the least amount of regulation when it came to things that would be difficult to enforce. Um, that's what I, so we kept it at 25%. There was some discussion about reducing the amount, but um, just going back to the August meeting, that's what I heard. Again, food must be available. Um, this is not to be considered a requirement for a full kitchen. Again, um, at one point I was contemplating requiring that the gross revenues for food be X. But again, going back to y'all's um, preference of less is more as far as regulation, then I just left it alone. But that, you know, we can discuss that if you'd like. Um, again, pertinent state and city licenses m must be um, acquired. Also for the building, life safety, land development, that's all the same. Um, I, the noise levels uh, would be consistent with the city code. Also, um, the next part that um, was deleted was all uses um, associated with the farm winery other than the growing of the product, the product to be used in the wine production, including but not limited to structures, areas of public gathering, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you're like, well, why did you take that all out? Well. <laughs> When I looked at a five acre minimum lot, when you put a hundred foot setback on that, you're left with almost nothing. <laughs> Just, you know, geometry shows that. I mean, not nothing, but there's not nothing, there's a lot less left over. So Bob and I um, discussed the situation. And so what we were proposing was to allow buildings to just be the minimum AG1 setback, a 60-foot front or 25 side, and then have all the parking interior. So we're still requiring parking to be at least 100 feet away from all property lines, and we're hoping um, that that would result in you would just see buildings instead of parking, but it would also allow for the flexibility on a smaller type lot. So that's what that's all about. Um, the Planning Commission had suggested um, adding hours of deliveries, which was a great point. Um, we just discussed that with the um, 
Methodist Church, um, you know, uh, recently about the delivery. So um, I added that hours of deliveries as well. And then number nine, um, another great um, input was you could contemplate a property that might have multiple use permits. You might have, you know, a petting zoo or you might have, which is, you can get a use permit for that or an event facility as well as the winery. So, okay, we don't want people carrying and serving and drinking their wine all over the place when somebody's, your kid is, you know, petting the llama. So um, I added in the area where wine, beer, and liquor are permitted to be served and consumed shall be identified on the site plan and shall not be allowed outside that defined area. So we could kind of um, encompass or uh, make sure that that type of use wasn't all over the property if there were other uses occurring on the property. And then the parking. So again, back to parking being 100 feet away from all property lines, um, screens, the type of um, uh, the type of surface it needed to be, and then the one parking space per two and a half attendees. So that's where we are right now. Um, and we just wanted to um, before we go to the next step, uh, that we were going in the right direction that y'all had wanted to go to. Because I think that um, we were um, a little surprised by the Planning Commission's reaction, um, and we just want to make sure we're going in the right direction as well. So, And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and, yeah, and so get any input. Any questions or comments, Paul? Um, Robin, when you made the comments early about the CZIM and the Planning Commission meetings not being attended by the community, how was that advertised to the community? Uh, so we send it, um, it's on the website mm -hmm. um, as well as it's in the Milton Herald. Um, and then I believe Greg, our communications director, sends out a mass of emails uh, on upcoming meetings, so. So in this particular case, the CZIM meeting and the Planning Commission meeting were addressing a text amendment to the alcohol ordinance, or no, what was the, the use how was I'm not dealing with alcohol. So okay. this is only the zoning ordinance, which is we were directed to uh, create a new use permit to allow a farm winery to serve um, beer and or liquor. Okay. Yeah. so. The fact that the community didn't attend, it's, um, I'm a little concerned about the fact that that's a representation of, well, let me say it differently. I'm concerned that when you put it out without some, well, let me say it even further differently. In this, we know there was a, there's a farm winery application before us. Had the, had the CZIM been advertised as a hearing for that particular farm winery, the attendance might have been very different because the neighbors would have seen the sign that would have been up in front of it and probably would have gathered. Um, so I think it's a bit of a misrepresentation, the fact that there was zero people there that had any interest, and we know that there is interest in the community about what's going to go on. And I'm not, I'm not taking a stab at staff. I just want to make sure that we take the opportunity to ensure that the community really understands that this is for this. We're, we're trying to create an, a, a use permit that is farm winery generic, but we know that we're addressing one in particular. It's hard to separate the two. Well, in this case, we are, at this point, we're only addressing the use permit. And just for historic reasons, I just celebrated my 14th year with the city, and I would say throughout the whole time, I have almost zero to five people come to CZIMs that involve text amendments. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm just, in yeah, general, I get that. that is not like, you know, the yeah. hot topic to, right. you know, get excited about typically, which I don't think that's a great reflection. I think that it's a really important thing. Right. Um, no, but I think it, when I think about two similar um, points in time in our city's history, when the Union Grill, for example, a restaurant at uh, New Providence and um, Freemanville was being introduced, CZIMs were well attended, planning commission meeting was well attended, there was a lot of concern from the community to make sure it was done right, and obviously it's it was done right because it's very successful there. Uh, same thing when Matilda's was introduced. You know, it was a unique uh, thing coming to the community. We hadn't contemplated it before. We were working on text amendments to make sure that we did that properly. Again, pretty high engagement from the community on a variety of reasons. So I, I think you're going to get a different level of participation 
when the applicant actually has to present themselves for consideration versus just being a text amendment for what we're, what we're working on now. I, I totally agree. I mean, if it comes to this being adopted and an applicant comes to apply for that, I totally agree. We give notice to everybody within a quarter mile of an impacted uh, property. So I totally yeah. agree with that. So is there an application from the current uh, farm winery there entity? There is not. There is not. Well, there's nothing to give an application for a farm winery, but if any of the other uses that you think might be occurring, no, there is no application. I have been working, I will say, that at the Planning Commission, um, Pam uh, from Pamelot was there along with her attorney, which it wasn't her alcohol attorney, it was her land use attorney. And um, we had a good discussion talking about you know, I think there needs to be a more holistic view of everything, mm -hmm. um, and so she is working with um, her uh, with her client on that. But tonight we're here just for uh, to look at the use permit. Okay, and I think just to piggyback on Paul, I, what I think you're trying to say is just by advertising and not knocking staff on communication, or whatever. But to your point too, Robin, by advertising a text amendment, it doesn't bring out as much. Uh, Enthusiasm from from the, uh, the citizens, so it may you know take on a different form if if they do apply for Correct. for something. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Peyton, really, yeah, just really quick, and this might be left for the future meetings. Was based on your presentation and planning commission's thoughts. I'm probably more lean just to talk about the the use permit itself. I'm probably more leaning in the direction of changing that may to a must and maybe upping the acreage. That's just, just my first glimpse at just the use use permit. And, and to must on which part? Where the owner must reside oh. at the property. Uh -huh. I think that if it ever passed, and I think that would be a protection in place, but that's just something to think about. And also, um, you know, I agree. I mean, this is a interesting use permit, and I think we'll just have to go through it at at that meeting when it comes comes before us because I don't like creating – use permits for one particular purpose unless it really is beneficial to the community and I guess we'll go right. down that road when we see it. So yeah. So I have a question uh, on, on one second. Carol? Oh go ahead. No. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off So there seem to be some events there now. As I drive by mm -hmm. and I'm like, hmm, so how does that how does that happen now if this is just in the formulation stage? I thought we were a ways away from those events. Did I misunderstand that? So uh, I haven't seen it personally, but I don't know whether the events are associated with the winery or whether it's other events. And I think that's something that we need to address if it's other events that are occurring because the farm winery is by right. And um, we will follow up with that as far as other activities happening that appear to be outside the norm of a equestrian facility well, they, slash they winery. They seem to be large a couple right. times that I've driven by. Right. So. Okay. Rick? So, so Robin and, and maybe Sarah, as of right now, we haven't approved any special use permits for that farm that's on Bethany Way. Correct. Right. Okay. So just it's whatever is currently zoned for allowed? We have not approved any use permits that have gone through council Correct. or even administrative permits. So there are no use permits specifically for that property? Correct. Okay. But to okay. clarify that, I guess. Yeah, the farm, farm winery, winery is by right. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. It's just like, you know, a vet clinic is by right. Right. Um, or a kennel is by right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But if there was a wedding there oh, this weekend. Oh, oh excuse me. One, Joe, right. I think had something first. Right. So, by right, does it require somebody to live on the property? Uh, for the farm winery, correct. No, no. Or for by is, right of what? My point is, there's nothing in the AG1 zoning that it says in order there. to get your zoning, you have to live on the property. Correct. So we shouldn't be thinking about having requirements for zoning that include you need to live on the property. But we do have other examples of other use permits. Uh, that are permitted in AG1, i.e. a bed and breakfast. But that's a little that's bit different, different, right? Because what we're talking about is the basic zoning of the property itself. 
this is a by right thing. And whenever we use that term by right, I get sort of. I see what you mean. So you're, you're shaking but, your head. But you're saying. Yeah. So what he's trying to, I think what uh, Councilman Jamison was saying was if this use permit to serve alcohol, i.e. beer and spirits, is approved, that he would want that person to live on the property. We're not saying right now, if somebody no, operates it. a winery, they have to live on the property. I'm getting a little tied up in this whole, we're trying to manage something that seems to be inherent in the zoning. And, and that's what's got me a little bit worried, but we don't have is, to trip Is that correct? Now. So we've I think, got time yeah, we have. Yeah. Okay, Paul? Yeah, I, I don't have an opinion, I just have a question. So in a scenario that you just talked about, where you're saying that by, and this is just for discussion purposes, in a scenario where you're concerned about the requirement for the proprietor or the property owner to live on site, you'd be okay with them not being required to live on site? If they serve alcohol. Uh, well, no, wine. separate and apart from the alcohol okay. part. I just, because I, I, I am agreeing with you about the, right. if, if it's a by right land use, I don't necessarily have to live on every piece of property I own. Right. If I own 10, I can't live on all 10. So if, if there's an occupancy requirement, maybe we're going down a wrong path with that. But the, where I want to pose a question for consideration is, what if that entity then becomes commercialized to the point where you've got a major brand name and just, you know, Christian Brothers or Gala Wines or something says, oh, that's a pretty cute little thing. And all of a sudden the craft beer concept becomes craft wine concept and you've got a major entity is suddenly interested. Does, do, you know, should we be thinking about whether the owner occupied comes into play to prohibit an undesirable that may be a corporate environment? You, suddenly you've lost the quaintness of a cute little farm winery, and it's a major commercial entity. I'm just posing that for thought. No, no, I don't, no, I don't have an opinion. That's valid. That's valid, Paul. I don't know that I can get to the point where that potentially poses a problem yeah, or I don't know. would be detrimental. So, I think so it's, it's something we need to keep our eye on yeah. because if we see some kind of shift, which I'm only grinning because... What a great problem to have, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's clamoring to get into Milton so they can put up their own farm winery. I think mm -hmm. that'd be a great position to be in. Yeah. So, um, so let's just, I think we can keep our eyes on the, the part that I have to keep reminding myself about, and I say this for everybody's consumption, is that it's difficult. I have to remind myself to separate what we're experiencing from the proprietor and landowner right now from the process we're going through as a city. And when, when there appear to be repeated, and I'll use the word offenses, um, whether they're regulated or unregulated, going on there, and they expect us to give them a clean slate for a pure measure of this, it's, it's hard. And we have to take that into consideration because the proprietor's creating biases in my mind about my willingness to grant things that are then by right, by writing a really clean ordinance, when I know that they're already in completely ignoring the city and its permits and its processes to do what they're doing today. You know, with, with events basically every single weekend, um, uh, music going on into the evening, um, you know, tents being erected that imply a pretty significant event, that's really problematic for me, and I'm having a really hard time separating the two. Let, let me ask you, you know, to that point, I think Carol brought that up too, if we can have staff check on that, if they are, you know, obviously it's, it's two separate things from the process we're going through, but uh, we mm -hmm. probably need to know we'll that, that if uh, we can uh, find yes, out if they are doing some things that they're not actually yeah, supposed I don't to be. I think Carol. I just didn't tell you observed. I don't right. know. I mean, I'm not willing to go that far doing things they're not supposed to be doing. That's not my vernacular. I'm just saying, driving by, I saw. A lot of people loading and unloading, which led me to believe that there are substantial activities there. Right. I'm just. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why. That's, that's just a little check on that. Me, I that, can't say that. that. Parsing is probably a good idea. Okay. Um, All right. Thank you. Peyton. Yeah. And Robin, I know you mentioned a more holistic view. I think that y'all are talking about with the uh, with her um, attorneys. That's something that I would like for y'all to continue to maybe talk about because. 
well, you get the farm winery use permit, and then, well, she's having, let's you know, say she's going to have special events, she wants special events, then does that mean she has to get a special event use permit, and how do you merge? You know, and I just want to make sure whatever we do, whether it's approval or denial, it's clean, everyone gets it, and we're on the same page, that's all. And that was our discussion today. Okay. So okay. she's working with um, her client to try to get together and okay. uh, present what her business plan is and what she's doing and oh, and then um, and then we'll and uh, the attorney will work with us and okay. we'll come up with a game plan and it's it's not unheard of to have concurrent use permit so okay. let's say if this uh, use permit gets approved for the text amendment that she would come with this and then she'd come in with you know the event facility and or bed and breath or whatever okay. it is. We can do it all together okay. and we'll right. work together on it okay. um, when it comes time. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, Paul? Just last comment. I would say directionally the things that you've taken away from the planning commission's mm -hmm. comments are on the right track. Okay. At least for the things that I heard today. I think the parking and the setback stuff, you've given it the appropriate consideration. I think you're on the right track with that. Okay. Sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, move on to our first presentation. Um, Tammy, if you will please sound that item. That item is consideration of an ordinance to amend appendix A, parks and recreation fees, and other charges. Chapter 34, Section 24 of the Milton City Code to allow for collection of fees to rent the Birmingham United Methodist Church baseball slash softball field. Agenda item number 20. 297 Parks and Recreation Interim Manager Tom McElveen. Okay. Do I have a uh, motion? Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve, to approve agenda item number 20 297. Second. Okay. I have a motion for approval on the first presentation item by Councilmember Jameson, a second by Councilmember Morick. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, we don't have any items under a public hearing, zoning agenda, or unfinished business, so we'll move on to new business. Will the city clerk please sound that item? That new business item is the consideration of subdivision plats and revisions. The name of the development is Lakeside at Crabapple, located at 980 Mayfield Road, landlot number 1099 and 1134. It's a final plat for 28 single family lots, 41 townhomes, a total of 69 units. The total acres is 13.76 acres, and the density is 4.41 lots per acre. Agenda item number 2298, Land Development Manager Tracy Wilds. Mayor, Council Members, hello. Tonight, I'm going to be presenting to you the final plat for Lakeside at Crabapple. It's located at 980 Mayfield Road, which is just north of the Milton Library. This development consists of five tracks uh, for a total of 13.760 acres. Tracks one through four will combine and then re-subdivide into 28 single family lots and 41 townhome units. Now, the thing that we're most excited about is track five. Track five, uh, the developer Taylor Morrison is transferring five acres out of the total 13.7 acres to the city of Milton to be used as a civic space. Right now, we're referring to the civic space as the lake or lake park. The, the photos here, in the upper right-hand corner, you will see a conceptual rendering um, that was done in conceptual design stage and was a vision, if you will, of what this area could one day become. The picture in the lower left was taken a week ago, and this is the progress of the mm. construction of, of the lake today. The new five-acre park will serve as a key gateway into downtown Crabapple <coughs> with many site upgrades. Residents are going to enjoy a beautiful lake with a dock, sidewalks, trails, a sitting arbor, benches along the trails, and new landscaping. So it's pretty exciting to see this 
this piece of property or this portion of the project develop from concept stage to construction stage. This portion of the project is almost complete. Um, uh, we do expect guests to enjoy this late fall. Currently, the city of Milton and Crabapple enjoys the green right across the street. And there's people there every day. We look out as we're sitting here and there's people there all the time. Hopefully in late fall, soon, they'll be able to enjoy a lake in the city of Milton in Crabapple. And so we, ex we expect the same type of activity daily on that site. And can I add one thing? That's just uh, Speaking of that, uh, the property that that's on was owned for a long time by the, and occupied by the Smith family, and they are sending, sending us some history and information on that. And at some point, I don't know if this is, is a, a firm in stone name of it or whatever, but maybe presenting some of that to council sure. just to discuss if we want to have some kind of token memory or something of the, of sure. the Smith family there. So. The project has not been named, so we'll okay. be open okay. to several suggestions. Uh, this final plat has been reviewed by city staff. It does meet the requirements for all the applicable city codes. Are there any questions? Any questions on this? Okay. Um, I, I do have a question, and it's not fair to ask you. Maybe Robin may have to help. or. Um, We've got Bob in the house, too. Well, but as Robin said, she's the been expert. here 14 years. Do you know when this property was actually zoned for this density of, and, you know, the whole area, Robin? And, and the, reason I, the reason I ask, and, and Greg's been great about communicating things and whatnot, but I think some people are thinking because this final plat is getting approved by us tonight, that's not the same as we're approving this density or this neighborhood. That's that's been in the works for a long. In fact, do you even know off the top of your head it's, when? It was, uh, I believe, it was June 2012. So the Crab Apple Form Based Code was adopted uh, during 2012, and then subsequently Deerfield was 14, and then amended in 15. So it was 2012. So yes, it's been a long process, and I think Bob Bashimi has been working with all the property owners in that east side um, to try to you know, get everything done, and you can see that from, you know, the extension of Charlotte Drive and whatever it's going to, Heritage Walk now, I think it's going to be called. Um, so it has been in the works, and, you know, I think that uh, also that uh, the developers spent a lot of money upgrading that dam um, that is going to be to our advantage, and that that uh, detention area is a regional detention area. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is... Uh, certain properties on that east side will drain into it and that they'll be paying the city a maintenance fee um, based upon their impervious areas or correct correct and so this is a great way to i mean i think it's just an incredible uh, development um, that isn't just oh we just did it yesterday it's been a long time planning so and just to take that one further and i, and I understand you know when we adopted the form based code and this was was planned out but as far as the density, and I don't remember off the top of my head, but the density in that area was probably already in place prior to that, correct? Right. So, and let me just, there was another step that was taken, and I think um, a council person, Jameson, was actually on the planning commission when this came before um, we require a preliminary plat. So it's not the first time that the public would see this. Um, they saw it what, probably about three years ago um, in pretty much this concept, this scenario uh, so the density in that area is four units per acre um, part of the civic area was zone t2 which is only one unit per acre um, but um, basically um, by the developer doing the work and donating the property they got some a benefit of that density uh, from that five acres um, was put on to and agreed upon that they would receive some density from that five acres. So when you look at the whole total, it's, uh, it is uh, consistent with what uh, the ordinance requires. So. Okay. Anybody? Yeah, as I recall, actually, the number of townhomes was reduced. I think at one point it was over 50 on some of the first presentations that were done, and we're at 41 now. And I think the single-family residence lots actually went up. If I remember correctly, do you remember that, Peyton? I think it's about what it was. I think. Yeah. But I guess my point, though, 
and the zoning was done like this eight is, years. Yeah, yeah, a long time. Ago. <laughs> My biggest point is zoning overall and crab and crab apple. Is, you know, I mean, I've been yeah. here long enough when it was all woods, and we hope to stay all woods. But yeah. that zoning has been in place for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So, just I, I say that so that people, when they see this plat being approved, it's not as though we're adding adding density now, and the council's not voting in more homes than was, was allowed. So. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Okay, I'll open up for motion. I did the last one. <laughs> uh, Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve, to approve agenda item number 20-298. Second. Okay. Um, I have a motion for approval from Councilmember Jameson, and I believe Councilmember Moore uh, was first with the second. So... All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, our next item, we're going to move on to reports. Is there anything the council would like to report on? You know, I'll just, just further the discussion on, again, um, the Smith family. I think Sean is going to get some more information and would like us just to consider that as we move forward with uh, any kind of remembrance of, of the family that lived there on the pond that we just talked about in the lake. Okay, we'll move on to staff reports. Bernadette, come on down. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as you know, we just began another fiscal year on October 1st. And finance staff are working to close out the books for FY 2020. Just a reminder that we will not have September financial statements on the agenda, as the city's final financial statements for the year are contained in the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or the CAFR, that will be published in March of 2021. Business licenses were due the second week of August, and staff is working with the remaining businesses to bring them into compliance. We have approximately 140 left um, to renew. Property tax bills went out for 2020. The due date for City of Milton property taxes is December 15th. This year we've included a sample bill with some of the definitions to hopefully aid property owners in understanding their tax bill's contents. Our bill's a little different than the county, so we wanted to put that out there. We've also included methods of payment and homestead exemption opportunities on the back side of that bill this year as well. Supplemental bills and refunds for prior year um, adjustments and overpayments to date have gone out as well. And lastly, um, Council approved an agreement with ClearGov on October 5th, and staff is working with that company um, to implement the new transparency portal, to implement a digital budget book for ease of um, exploring our budget, and the budget processing platform for ease of our staff to work together on producing a budget annually. So the goal is to have the transparency portal live in, at the end of uh, November for all the citizens to be able to review. And that really covers our major updates for finance for the quarter. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you have so much. Evening. Okay. Now I'll open up for a motion to adjourn if there's not anything else that anyone has. Second. Okay. I have a motion from Councilmember Longoria to adjourn and a second from uh, Councilmember Moore. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous.